Connection. Hello everyone. Welcome back to Show and Tell. I'm Billy, but if you've seen me before and you don't recognize me, there's a very good reason. And as this episode unfolds, you will learn why I have turquoise eyeshadow on, why I have eyeliner a la 1950s on, why I have a an authentic 1950s vintage sweater. Let me stand up so you can see more of it. But before I get into all of that, uh, let's talk about where you can find me. So it seems like even though you may have subscribed, you don't always get the notifications. If you're not on YouTube at the moment that they decide to notify you, you're not going to see it. So here's my suggestion to anybody who wants to know when I'm going to be on next. The probably best place is Instagram, and my Instagram handle is Billy Toy, and I'll put that on the screen. Do subscribe because it does help me with rankings, and do hit the like, like button, thumbs up, um, because that will also help me get the message out to more viewers. So that, that would be a nice thing to do, thank you. And if you're so inclined, I do have a Kofi account where you can buy me a coffee. I'll put that on the screen as well. So, let's see. The first thing I wanna do is introduce you to Pearl. She was my mother. I don't know if you can see the resemblance. This is a book that I wrote about her about a year after she passed away. It was part of my grieving process. It's 300 pages, and it's a kiss and tell all kind of a thing about where she grew up, something about her parents, her grandparents, the very unique lifestyle that she had as a single mom to only me, her only child. Um, we were very, very close, and I'm so grateful to have had such a unique and wonderful mother and such a, a great relationship, and we were able to do so many things together. And the more you watch my podcast, the more you'll learn about me, and sometimes she comes up. So, yeah, it's available on Amazon. The title is Pearl's Party, and You're Invited. And this is a caricature of her done, I think, in the 1980s, but it's really kind of representative of how she looked. Her hair was always this French curls, bouffant kind of a hairstyle. She wore turquoise eyeshadow. She wore red lipstick. She had black, black hair that she never colored. My hair is much grayer than hers ever was, even at her death. Um, and she was a larger-than-life personality. She was kind of a big woman. She got bigger as the years went on. She wore big jewelry, and I do remember from my earliest days of seeing her wear hats. This was one of her hats, and she um, kept her hats in the original hat boxes. So if you know Philadelphia, you may know of the Blum store. I don't think it's in business anymore. This was their logo, this pretty little parasol and their colors were this pink and black. Um, this hat was purchased in their millinery department, and there's a beautiful label inside, and this is their original hat box. I have a couple of other hats of hers in here, small things like this. Oops. Oh, the sweater, sorry. The sweater was also hers. I don't know where she purchased this. If she, she might have purchased it on her honeymoon because my parents went to Bermuda. They went, unfortunately, a while after I was born. Um, that's a long story that you can read about in the book and you can see pictures of her. She's pretty foxy in some of the photographs I have in the book. But I, th I think this was made in some part of the UK, and Bermuda would have been a part of that um, constellation of countries. 
So it's a mink collar, and there are 31 little snaps that this fur collar snaps on and off. I think you might be able to see that. Um, she also purchased a white, like an ivory colored collar. And I have a white mink hat, so maybe some other time I'll do a little switcheroo. Um, I've never worn it with the white collar. I prefer the darker mink. Um, and then you see there's this rhinestone clasp and there's little rhinestone sort of faux cufflinks. Um, I put on a rhinestone bracelet to excite you. And this happens not to be rhinestone. This is one of her diamond necklaces um, in the Art Deco style, which is my favorite period. The earrings were not hers, but they're of the same vintage. I, I would put this mid-50s, early to mid-50s. Um, at the very end of today's show, I'm going to run a video of women of roughly the same time period who were in a knitting competition to see who was the fastest knitter. I think you'll enjoy that, so stick around for that. Um, I don't always talk about my whips or my FOs, my works in progress or my finished objects, but today, since it's just me, I don't have a guest, I thought I might go into a little bit of that with you. So I've mentioned a few times that in January of 2020, before the pandemic, Vogue Knitting Live took place in New York. And it was my first time attending one of those. I attended a fashion show and I had no idea that at the end of the fashion show they were going to do a yarn toss. And I had a very nice seat, very centrally located, and they seemed to find it easy to toss the yarn into that section. So I didn't just catch one ball or two balls, I caught three. And they were all in kind of complementary colors. So I thought, okay, now I'm stuck. I have to figure out what I'm going to make with these. So the yarn is papyrus, papyrus, if you're Egyptian, I think, by Fibra Natura. And it's 78% cotton, 22% silk. Here's a couple of little bits that I have left over. I really used all of it. Um, let me see the three colors. Do they say on here? That would be ether that I just showed you. There's also dusty rose, which looks like this. This pink color. And then there's elderberry. That's this sort of aqua kind of color. Uh, the pattern that I chose to make with it is called Waiting for Rain. And the only shawl that I ever made was one for my husband, which is kind of like a jumbo scarf. Um, but I like to do lace. I think it has a vintage feel to it. So I chose this pattern. It looked interesting. It has a lot of short rows. Let me see if I can stand back so you'll get a more thorough view. Actually, I can maybe throw it on. So I wasn't going to have enough with just those three to complete this. But I had some ballet pink from Pearl Soho. This is their line weight, 100% merino. Here's the label for that. Which I had bought and had them wind for me because it's very, very fine. Um, I 
34 stitches to 4 inches is what they're suggesting. So I used it double to kind of mimic the weight of um, the cotton and silk. So yeah, I mean it wasn't a really great thing to do to blend the wool with the silk, but I had this which I was supposed to hold double in another project and the yarn that I had purchased actually ended up being heavy enough without adding this in. So I had this ball that I couldn't return because it was already wound and nothing to do with it. And as you know, I try very hard not to keep stash. So I was on a mission to use this up and I thought the colors worked well together. So that is a finished object, one of many that I have achieved during this pandemic. Uh, if you're a first-time viewer, I don't think I mentioned that I'm in New York. I'm in New York City. So we've been holed up in our apartment quite a bit of time during these last seven or eight months. And it looks like things are getting bad again, so I don't know where we're going to go this time. Uh, if we're going to have to lock down again. But in any event, I'm super happy knitting. Um, this is another story. It's, I haven't uh, woven in the ends yet, but let me tell you a little history of this. Let me back up. I grew up in a family that loved to travel. My father and his wife visited all seven continents in their lifetime. And that travel bug really bit me. They took me to some wonderful places with them. So after retirement, my husband and I were really starting to enjoy traveling of our own. And I tend to have a little bit of a weight problem, so I'm always kind of watching it. And just a diet doesn't really work for me. But one of the trips that we were on, we were walking so much every single day. I would say a good 10 miles probably on an average day. And when we came home from that vacation, which was in Central Europe where they're heavy into noodles and pastries and butter, we both came home weighing less. So I thought, there's, there's something here, there's something to this, and there's no reason why we can't do that at home. So I put us on a one day a week walking itinerary. Each week for a few weeks in a row, I was picking a different neighborhood that we didn't know well that we would explore. We walked over a couple of different bridges and into communities on the other side of the river from us that are new and hip that just weren't, weren't well known, like Williamsburg, we didn't really know. And after a while, I thought, well, this is okay, but it's just me and you, and I could organize this for other people, and we could make new friends. Why not? So I started a meetup group, and the reason I'm telling you all this is just background on how this came to being. One of the women in my meetup group, very lovely woman from Thailand, she lives in the United States now. She had been in Thailand and she bought some yarn. And when she learned that I was a knitter, and the only reason I think it came up was one day after one of my walking tours with my group, the restaurant where we all ate lunch together was around the corner from one of the very upscale New York yarn shops called String on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And I had never been there. So I said to my group, OK, anybody who wants to come with me, I'm going around the corner now to this yarn shop. And she said, oh, yes, I'd like to go. And she ended up buying something there. I didn't know she was a knitter. The next time I saw her, she brought me four, I think, four balls of yarn, two of these and two in a different color way. These are Lang Super Socks. And obviously it's sock weight. It's alpaca. And there's a pretty little picture on here of how it would look if you used it as a sock yarn. I, however, 
decided to hold it double and I thought these colors would be very pretty in a scarf for my son. He's fair, he has mm -hmm. like chestnut brown hair and blue eyes. So browns and blues are pretty good on him. So I found this pattern obviously on Ravelry. I'll put the name of the pattern, I forget what it is. But it's a little interesting. This hasn't been blocked yet, but it has like these little, it's sort of like a little bundle of twigs almost. And there is some kind of striping going on. It's not how it would look if it was just held singly, but um, so I made a pretty decent length scarf for him. But when I got to about, when I got to about here, I was only like a foot and a half in. I was calculating how much yarn I had left, and I thought, I'm not gonna have, I'm not gonna have enough yarn. I don't know where I can get this because she bought it in Thailand, but it seemed mm -hmm. like a you know typical brand that I should be able to find, and I did find it, but I couldn't find this dye lot. So I went on eBay and I started searching around to see who's selling this yarn. And lo and behold, I found a German company who had this colorway. So I messaged them to ask them if they had this exact dye lot. I mean, this was a long shot because we're talking Germany and she had bought this in Thailand. But they wrote back, yes, actually they had quite a bit in my dye lot. So I was really excited. And I think just as I was getting ready to order it, I saw the shipping price go way up. It was like over $40 to ship whatever the quantity was. I think even one ball was gonna cost that. So I thought, wow, what happened? It was $8 shipping the last time I looked. Now it's over 40. The borders closed because of the pandemic and they were very uh, confined in their different shipping methods that they could now use. So I wrote to them and, and they explained to me, like, this is the only way that we can ship under the current government restrictions. So I thought, well, okay, I'm just not willing to pay that much for shipping. The yarn's not that expensive. But I was afraid of ordering too little when it when the shipping finally did come down and I did go ahead and order it, I ordered even more because I didn't want to go through that again. And I also didn't want to risk not being able to get my dye lot. So I ordered seven balls. Billy, what were you thinking? I don't know where I went wrong in my calculation, but two balls plus a little bit made this entire scarf. So I have a lot of this yarn. And remember, no stash. So if you're not gonna do stash, what are you gonna do? You have to use it up. So I decided that I would knit him a hat, a matching hat, and mittens and socks. And I'm hoping that with all of that, I will use up all this excessive amount of this yarn that I have. These are not colors that I would want to make myself a sweater in necessarily. So, although I probably have enough to make a, a sweater for myself, um, now I have this major project. So that is what is on my needles now. He told me that he really would prefer a balaclava instead of just a toque or beanie. So I am sort of uh, improvising from some patterns that I saw on Ravelry. I think people are always interested, I think knitters are always interested in seeing how other knitters knit. So I am going to just knit a little bit and you'll be able to see what I do. It, it's awkward sitting like this, but let me see what I can do here. I'm 
guess I should tell you there's two pearls and then there's six knits. So you'll see for me the transition is pretty smooth. There's not a lot of motion here. I've been knitting every single day since this pandemic began and knock on wood, I have no pains, no uh, joint problems. Knitting is very easy for me um, in terms of muscle movement, bone movement, joint movement, whatever. I mean, there's not a lot going on. It's, you know, I could sit in a tight airplane seat next to somebody and not bother them unless I was knitting with straight needles. That might be a different issue, but that's it. I hope you could see that on screen. I'm using a different camera today than I use when I interview my guests. I've had some complaints about the clarity of my picture, which I'm sorry, my computer's three years old, but today I'm using a digital camera, so I think the image should be clear, less fuzzy. And I do apologize for that. One of these days I'll get a new computer. But I love the computer I have. I just replaced the battery, which was an experience to open the back of the computer all by myself with a little miniature Phillips head screwdriver. That was really uh, an adventure. Okay, so now you've seen me knit a little. Let's see what else do I have to share with you today. Oh, yeah, getting back to travel for a minute. How many of you, maybe you could comment below, how many of you have open house in your city? Open house started in London. I don't know what the year was. It was before 2001 because in the fall of 2001, it started here in New York. And for short, they call it OHNY for Open House New York. If you're not familiar with Open House, it's a weekend, one weekend out of the year, and it's different times in different countries, I guess based on when their good weather is. In New York, it's in the fall, it's always in October. So that one weekend, places that are generally not open to the public, like the waterworks or um, private residences, architects' homes, architects' offices, design firms, it's mostly around design, the built environment, um, architecture, places of interest. They could be municipal facilities, they could be private. There's a, a whole panoply of places that open up. And there's a whole schedule that you can see ahead of time. In the early days, there were no reservations. You would just go and get online, and the lines weren't that long because a lot of people didn't know about it. But by the 10th year, so many people knew about Open House New York and the wonderful places that they couldn't ordinarily get in to see that they started taking reservations and limiting the numbers of people. So I kind of got a little bit turned off from continuing to do it, and I've seen a lot of the places at this point but this year, because of the pandemic, they did some things online, which was interesting. And this past weekend, they did OHWW, Open House Worldwide. I think if you search on Google, you should be able to find something about it. There were, I believe, 40 cities over the course of 48 hours, and they were doing it round the clock because obviously, when I'm asleep, Australia's wide awake. So I did try and watch quite a bit. I took my eight hours to sleep, but the whole rest of the time I was kind of tuned in and watching from different cities, Monterey, Mexico, um, 
Turin, Italy. Um, they were in Zurich. They were in Tallinn, Estonia. Uh, Chicago was amazing, amazing. The buildings that they're building at the confluence of the river that are over a hundred stories, residential buildings, you know, some really fabulous architecture. So if architecture is something that you really enjoy, or city planning, urban planning, because some of these cities are plagued with rivers that overflow and other types of issues. Um, Lagos, Nigeria, a serious housing crisis. There's a lot of, I think half their population is impoverished, so housing is a real issue for them. They're very, very interesting. If you have a chance to see any of them, there weren't any that were bad, in my opinion, at least of the many that I saw. So I just wanted to mention that. Okay, I think that's it for today. So don't go away. I'm going to break away to this little video for you to watch. And let me say goodbye. Nice to see you again. And I'll see you next time. Toodaloo. Tension increases as the seven top knitters in the land prepare their needles for combat. On this final judgment day, speed and accuracy in following eight separate patterns, each for 20 minutes, will produce a new national knit-off champion for 1971. Two rounds down and six to go. All right, now get on your mark. Get set. Go! Mrs. Nazar, representing Western Australia with the controversial European technique, has been knitting since she was a little girl of nine in her native Bavaria. Top Tasmanian Mrs. Newman keeps herself and her family in all knitted garments. She had an early start at the age of four. New South Wales wool knit-off champion Mrs. Green has been knitting for over 50 years, with something on her needles all the time from ladies' dresses to men's cardigans for family and friends. Mrs Greenwood, knitting for Victoria, began her practice of the craft 40 years ago with two nails and a length of string. The fastest pair of needles in the Northern Territory, wielded by Mrs Smith of Alice Springs, a cardigan and jumper specialist. The hopes of South Australia are pinned on mother of three and grandmother of six, Mrs Glazebrook, visiting Sydney for the first time in her life. Mrs Rope entered the contest just for fun and with her dexterous continental style became Queensland champion. What can go wrong? Suddenly find you've got too many or too less stitches at the end of the pattern and you know you've thrown the whole thing out. How do you think you're going anyway? Oh, not too good. No. You're being a bit pessimistic, oh, no, aren't you? I've made mistakes. I mean, unforgivable mistakes. So I just got to put up with it. Well, you must have done very well anyway to be your own state champion already yeah. and to be here in the first place. Might have been a fluke. <laughs> Mrs. Glazebrook, do you get very nervous in the competition like this? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> a few bit jittery, you know. <laughs> My fingers sort of won't work quick enough. <laughs> well, with nervous tension, one tends to get a little bit clammy and it makes the wool sticky on the needles. This particular one is quite good, except there is a, uh, a mistake here. Edge. Mm. And the edge, side edge is very cool, very mm -hmm. As completed samples come off the needles, they go to the judging panel, a strict but compassionate triumvirate, expert knitters all, representing the CWA, the wool board and Peyton's knitting wools. After three years' experience on the bench, Miss M. Tregoning can almost pick a winner by watching the contestants at work. Even, even, even that's correct, yes. You can 
uh, tell by the temperament of the woman just how she's knitting. Just uh, Temperament is one of the main things, really. Isn't knitting a bit old-fashioned today? No, knitting isn't old-fashioned. It's uh, more on the increase. And these knitting competitions that we hold have uh, certainly inspired a lot of people to uh, take up knitting again. Do you really like knitting? Oh, I love it. Yes, I do, really. I love it. But, uh, not under these circumstances, by any means. What sort of chance do you think you've got in the competition? Oh, well, <laughs> I haven't thought about it at all. I just try to do my best for the honour of Western Australia. And we're all just going hard at it and hoping for the best. Thank you.